Welcome to another episode brought to you by Imagine Strength, the future of safe, simple, and effective high intensity training equipment. Are you a hit studio owner looking for equipment that's not just top notch, but also tailored to your specific needs? Imagine Strength is your answer. Inspired by the legendary Arthur Jones, Imagine Strength is revolutionizing the hit industry with their state of the art yet affordable equipment. Their team doesn't just sell hit equipment, they live and breathe it. I've personally experienced their gear at the Resistance Exercise Conference, and let me tell you, it was an intense workout that I won't soon forget, in the best way possible, of course. So why choose Imagine Strength? Number one, they provide customized solutions for hit studios. Number two, they have budget-friendly yet high-performance designs. And number three, they're committed to innovation and excellence in high-intensity training specifically. Founder Jeff Turner and his dedicated team are on a mission to make HIT accessible to everyone. Getting started is easy. Number one, visit imaginestrength.com. Number two, consult with their expert team. And number three, choose the equipment that will skyrocket your business. Don't wait. Head over to imaginestrength.com and elevate your HIT studio today with Imagine Strength. Laura Still here, and welcome back to High Intensity Business, your one-stop shop for elevating your hit business and fueling your passion for high-intensity training. This is episode 430, and my guest today has done some pretty serious damage to his knee, tells me, um, which is resulting in a rather lengthy rehab, and he had the great idea to record some podcasts together, do a series of podcasts to actually discuss the recovery process, and I thought that was a great idea, and so here we are. Um, and that guest is Dr. James Fisher. And uh, I think this is going to be really useful if um, you, the listener, have uh, sustained or are dealing with an injury and you're looking to learn how you can rehab that effectively. Um, and we're going to be talking about all of the different angles related to that. Uh, but also, if you're just looking for, obviously, you know, rehab guidance as it relates to your clients' um, injuries, they have too. And a lot of us in personal training or high intensity training are working with clients of all kinds of uh, niggles and, and legacy old injuries and new injuries that come out of nowhere we have to be able to deal with as well. So I think this is going to be useful and give you some guidance and tactics and how you can address that as well. So anyway, the guest today, Dr. James Fisher, course leader and senior lecturer at the School of Sport and Health and Social Sciences at Southampton Solent University in the UK. He specialized in exercise physiology, biomechanics and resistance training. And James is an active researcher publishing, publishing a vast number of peer-reviewed articles related to health and fitness. James, great to see you again. Thanks for joining me on the podcast today. Lawrence, thank you so much for having me. Um, as you said, this is a real opportunity for me uh, to discuss, obviously, something that's very personal to me. And, but as you highlighted in the introduction, I think it might be useful to some of the trainers listening, um, not just for themselves, but also for the clients they're working with. Obviously, we as physiologists and trainers, when we experience an injury, we are in that position, in that first-hand experience, but I think sometimes if we haven't had that injury, then we are very reliant upon what our um, client might give us. And sometimes that's only what they're willing to give us. Um, and so we, we, we need as much information as we can. And this is a relatively common injury. Um, so I think most people, most trainers over a long enough time would, would experience a client with this, this injury. So. Uh. So I obviously didn't ask you any questions on social media. I sounded so insensitive, like I didn't care. And I was like, James, as much as I care about your well-being and hopefully you're not feeling too much pain, don't tell me anything because I want to be really authentically curious <laughs> on the podcast. So what did you do, you donut? What have you yeah. done to me? <laughs> yeah, okay. okay. So so but the backstory, let's go from the beginning. So uh, 12th of July, so it's exactly eight weeks ago from today, 12th of July, um, playing basketball, um doing, of course. doing something that yeah exactly doing something that i've done a million times over um uh planted a foot pushed off to my planted my right foot pushed off to my left and my knee just just buckled under me uh, my right knee buckled under me and originally in my eye line and my thought it buckled outwards and uh, and i was rolling on the floor screaming like a girl in agony um, you know, I mean, I mean, I was literally turning circles on my back while holding my knee. The guys I was playing basketball, wow. great. They got an ice pack on it sort of straight away. And literally before I really had cognizance of what was going on, 
And then somebody said, let's, you know, do you want to drive to a hospital or do you want, or do you want to drive you to a hospital? What should we call an ambulance? And at that point, I sort of went, okay, I need to like stop and look at my leg and see what I've actually done. Because I didn't really have a good sense of what I'd done, just the pain. Somebody said, how did the pain feel? I said, imagine a drill going through your knee, but it's not a drill. It's a drill that's about four inches across. It was like my entire knee was in agony and just, oh my God. Me. Yeah. So anyway, I, um, I got home. Uh, one of the guys gave me a ride home. And of course, my wife's a physiotherapist, as some of you will know. And, um, you know, we basically said, okay, well, we, you know, we'll, get, we'll have ice on it. So I had ice on it through the night and had it with some degree of elevation and support, so I have a knee bend in it and so forth. And, and the next day, I went through to hospital where it was x rayed and they said, okay, good news is there's nothing broken. But by this point, the swelling was, you know, substantial. So in, in my head, it was pretty clear that I'd done something, um, so, something significant. Um, and the fact that there was no broken, nothing broken was obviously positive, but I knew that there was going to be something serious. So now you know how our National Health Service works over here. So the next point, our accident emergency department referred me to orthopedics who called me that day and instantly referred me on to physiotherapy. And I knew it, <laughs> I knew at that point, like physio were just going to bat me straight back again. As soon as they saw it, they were going to bat me straight back. Um, so I went private, I have private healthcare, fortunately, and, uh, booked an MRI and a week, it was about a week later, probably not quite a week later that I got the results back from the MRI and the MRI, I actually have some of the text here. Hang on. So if you just went through NHS, you would never really have known what's up and just let kind of time take its course and hope that it would just get better over time. So I think that that's unbelievable. Physio, if I would have seen a physio, any physio would have probably um, sort of said that I can do absolutely nothing with this. I've got to refer you right. back to orthopedics. An orthopedics might then have referred me for a scan or an MRI. I see. You just would have been long winded. Yeah. I, 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 and such. Yeah. I could see that taking probably a month. Um, yeah. And I. No longer. Yeah. Um, so I wasn't willing to wait for that. Um, so. I had, I went private, got an MRI, um, which in the UK cost me about 300 pound. So it's uh, actually kind of reasonable. That's, that's pretty reasonable. I mean, I was yeah. in a bucket like two days later, um, and that was partly because of my inability to travel to where it was any sooner. Um, and obviously childcare and my wife's work and so forth. So I went through and I got the results probably 24 to probably 48 hours later. And the results read 44 year old male. Uh, complaints of pain in the right knee during following an injury, um, uh, catastrophic trauma. Oh God! Um, has revealed, and then it goes on with a, a host of things. But fundamentally, what they said was um, a ACL tear. Right. Yeah. So, which is which is probably what most people at this point are expecting, and is and is the commonplace injury. Um, Lateral collateral, so ACL is anterior collateral ligament. It runs from the femur down to the tibia and it prevents kind of anterior translation of the tibia. So it holds the tibia back and in place. And I that's guess. on the, fr is that on the front, isn't it? Right. So, so everything is within the knee, everything between the femur Sorry. and the tibia. Okay. So it runs from the back to the front and it stops the tibia from translating forward. So my knee does a really nice thing where if this is my femur and this is my tibia, my knee can do this. Lovely. <laughs> It's not meant to be. Don't, don't go on YouTube, guys, to see that because it'll probably make you uh, sick, sick in your mouth. Um, <laughs> it's not as drastic as that, but you get the idea. <laughs> then there's a the lateral ligament, and I've got a, a sprain to the lateral collateral ligament. I've got a tear to the rope to the medial ligament. Um, so that's the medial collateral ligament. So that's on the inside of the knee. So the, so the, the, the center of the knee is shot. The center of the knee is two ligaments, the anterior and the posterior collateral ligament, and the anterior is gone. The medial ligament is gone. The lateral ligament is damaged. Uh, I've torn the meniscus. So meniscus is the menisci, are like the shock absorbers between the femur and, and the tibia. And I've got a tear in that, which is actually, again, relatively common. And I've got 
quite significant bone bruising to the femur and the tibia. And, um, and yeah, the, the, the comical part was that at the time it came through, I was somewhat weight bearing again. And I was like, I, maybe this isn't as bad as we first thought it was. And then I get through this email and I just read the word catastrophic. And I think any time a medical professional puts that in. Yeah, it's serious. That's serious. Yeah. Now, actually, this is, this is quite interesting because this is, uh, uh, like I said, relatively common. That's a loose term. The ACL, meniscus, and medial ligament going at the same time is, is relatively common. Okay. And it's called the uh, unhappy triad of O'Donoghue. <laughs> so it has its own name. Happily named. Yeah. yeah. And, and, um, <laughs> You can, and you can go on Google some of the athletes that have had it. Um, one of which is, um, is Gronkowski from, uh, from the NFL, played with Tom Brady, obviously for a long time. Um, uh, a Gronk, for those people that know, played in a pretty significant knee and elbow brace and suffered some pretty significant injuries. Um, but it, but it's interesting because one of the key things that I did is once I knew the injury, I went back and looked at athletes that I knew that had the injury and how they rehab. Similar specimens to yourself. Yeah. Well, you know, that's how I just, that's how I perceive <laughs> myself. No, because what's fascinating is when people talk about full recovery from an injury like this, so an ACL tear is relatively common and, um, it's like, like 66 people in a hundred thousand athletes will, will experience an ACL tear. So that's relatively common. Um, but one of the things that they refer to when they say successful rehab is not successful return to play at the previous level, mm. full mobility, uh, strength, stability of the knee, but it's not necessarily, okay, you were a premier league soccer player or an NFL player or an NBA player. And now you're back in the NBA and we all know, I mean, you, you and I, you know, using the NBA analogy. We've all seen our athletes like our Penny Hardware or Grant Hill or insert name here, who yeah. have been world, world-class players, had a, a significant injury and never quite got back to where they were, um, you know. So, so I guess the interesting thing for me was to go back and look and see a list of names, some of which were people that either retired from it, that never got back from it to their previous level, or some that did get back to their previous level. Um, and that, that in itself is actually one of the first things that I want to kind of get into because I ironically used to lecture on um, career ending injuries and um, cessation of an athletic career as a result of injury. And it relates very closely to the Kubler-Ross grief model. So when, when somebody experiences an injury, the, the analogy is made that it's like experiencing grief. Hmm. And I certainly, I mean, I sat there in the first, well, one, one of the things that's interesting about this, I'll talk through the stages in a second, is you can move forwards and backwards through these processes. Yeah. So the first process is shock. So there's a complete, like, the response to the bad news, you're in complete shock over it. Now, I don't know that that ever really goes away. Like, I still sit here now, and I'm like, man, I just can't believe I did this. I just can't, like, I keep expecting to wake up and it'd be a bad dream. Um, so you move through the processes of kind of injury or recovery in the same way you would grief, but you can still move, you can still kind of regress to those earlier stages. So um, if I run through the, the adaptive grief model that I always worked from as an academic was shock, then denial. So basically kind of trying to avoid the, the, the inevitable, trying to say, oh, maybe this isn't as bad as mm -hmm. some and I was very likely at that point when I received the email, go, maybe it's not as bad as we first thought, so forth. Mm. Uh, anger and frustration. Um, then there's bargaining. So is there, you know, and certainly from my point of view, my bargaining has been, okay, I'm fitter than a lot of people that might have this injury. I know more about anatomy and physiology and strength training, so maybe I'll recover quicker. Um, okay. Then there's depression, then there's testing and kind of trying to identify solutions. And then finally there's acceptance and kind of seeing kind of, okay, this is how long it's going to be. This is what I need to do. Um, and I think like for me, a part of this podcast, I don't want to get too bogged down with this, 
is to realize that every time a client stands in front of you, there's, if there's an injury or if there's an underlying anxiety towards exercise or training or whatever it might be, then there's a psychological attachment to that as well, a physiological. So maybe they have low back pain or maybe they have had an injury or maybe they're just nervous about being in the gym. And some of those things we deal with day to day and say, okay, if they're not confident in the gym, these are ways we can improve confidence. But if they've had an injury, then knowing these kind of stages of recovery can, might be key towards helping them, um, helping their recovery, helping their mm -hmm. physical and their psychological recovery. Um, one of the key things with athletes a lot of the time is physiologically now we can recover quicker than we can psychologically. So the likelihood is I went back on the basketball court for probably another 12 months, realistically another 12 months. But in 12 months, it's incredibly likely every time I make any movement that I am going to have in my head, it's the moments that I've had in the past of this injury. This happens to athletes, doesn't it? Where they don't have that same confidence when they return to the professional yeah. sport. Yeah. So I think it's, that in itself for me is really interesting. Um, and I think it's something that as trainers or, or anybody working with any client, strength and conditioning coach or personal trainer, whatever it might be, we kind of need to have in mind um, whether we have or haven't experienced them. Um, you know, I've had, a few, I've had a lot of text messages with a few people about this and they all come back and go, gosh, you're so, you know, you're really being really pragmatic about this. And we I spoke to Dave Smith. I thought you'd be your first. <laughs> I spoke to Dave Smith and I spoke to Luke, who's obviously a good friend of Carlson. Yeah. And, um, and they both said, you know, it sounds like you're being really kind of realistic about this and that's really healthy. Um, and, and that's partly because in my head, I said, okay, I, I'm not going to rush rehab. I'm going to accept that this is going to take a long time and I'm going to use that time to get back in. You know, I want my curve to be, an upward trajectory, not undulating trajectory. I get better, then I make it worse. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. so um, but at the same time, for example, some of the guys I play basketball with have got a training session tonight. And there's a part of me kind of is, no it, way. wants to go along tonight and say hi to them and, and maybe just kind of just hold the basketball <laughs> or maybe take a break. You know, take a few free breaths. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. But of course, we, but we, we both know that's a really slippery slope. Right. Can I just, just to go right back to the beginning in terms of when you actually did the injury, do you have any idea like how that happens? Is that just a, is that just a freak thing where all the forces hit the knee in a certain way? Is it due to fatigue, the muscles being fatigued? Is it the fact that there's a lot of wear and tear there from sports and stuff over the years? I'm curious how you think about what caused it and how that happens. So, Lawrence, I'll tell you, I've played over a hundred different scenarios as to why it might have happened. Right. Because in my head, I was doing nothing any different. All he did is change direction, right? Right well, to left. All, all I did is do something that I've done a hundred times over. Yeah. And, and over a hundred thousand times over. I have no idea. And, and I played out so many different why did this happen? What if? What if? I was wearing a new pair of basketball shoes. Oh. So, I, so of course, the, the psychology of it, I, like, I'm never going to play in those shoes again, right? <laughs> because I'm going to be like, the, was it the shoes? Did the shoes slip? Did the shoes grip differently? Did my foot turn, pivot? Did it did something happen? Okay. Then there's, I was having a bad game. So was I playing more aggressive and trying to overcompensate? Um, you know, what, what was I doing? What happened differently? Had I done a, I, you know, I think back now, did I do a leg session too recently? And I was, it's really easy to create narrative fallacy, isn't it? And of course, and the, yeah. real, the reality is that I'll never know. Mm. I, and it is probably nothing more than a complete freak accident. Really? So I, I'm, as it was, as it was put by our, by our friend and my colleague, the James Steele, that you didn't do this playing basketball. You did this playing basketball at 45 as if you were still 18. <laughs> right. Um, and of course, that, right. that, that's the point, isn't it? You know, I mean, I laugh at the guys that I play with and a couple of them are, are close to my age and they're saying, oh, we're now starting to think about whether we should carry on because now right. we've seen the injury that can happen. And I'm like, I don't think it's basketball. I think this is the way that I approach the game. Like mentally and physically, to some extent, I was still able to play it that, in that way. Yeah, uh, 
And I was still pushing my body to play in that way. And my body just wasn't there. I mean, if I think back to the amount of training and the degrees of training and the warm ups and the flexibility work and all the other things that I did then that I don't do now from an athletic training perspective, um, you know, maybe I just wasn't in the same physical condition to play in the same way. One of the other things I think about too is I know loads of people your age who play uh, or played. And probably didn't, haven't sustained the same kind of injury. I'm sure they've had other injuries. I mean, if someone's been playing the sport long enough, you're bound to build up a list of like minor injuries at least. Um, but one of the things I think about, maybe this is silly to say, is that none of those probably strength train. And you've actually been strength training. You've actually been doing, you know, leg pressing, squats, leg extensions, leg curls. You built up probably a really, really strong connected tissue around the knee obviously really strong and, um, and good symmetry across all your lower body musculature. And you've been doing that consistently over many years. And yet even that was not sufficient to stop it from happening. I, I mean, and that's it. That's it. And, and the reality is this is sports. Right? Yeah. 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 We play sports because it's fun, not because it's healthy. The risk of injury from sports is, is significant. The risk mm, of injury from strength training should be zero. And of course, I am going through this process with a view towards playing basketball again in the future. But if I'm honest, I, it's, it's, very, it's very much in my mind that I might never bother playing basketball again because it detracted from so many other things that I wanted to do this summer, whether that's ride a bike, whether that's the way it's impacted my strength training, whether that's play golf. You know, I, I wasn't able to drive for six weeks. Uh, so that impacted the things I could do with my son. We went on, we went on vacation uh, and I couldn't go down water slides and things like that. Why can't you go down water slides? Because I've been in a leg, been in a leg brace. Oh, for all right. That, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's a leg brace 24 hours a day. I've been sleeping in oh. this huge metal cage that limits the range of oh, limits, right. limits any rotation and limits any um, flexion extension beyond 10 and 90 degrees. Oh, uh, what was that like getting that off? Is it off now, right? It's off. So I could take it on and off to like shower and things like that. Okay. Um, oh, and, right. And I had two, one for day and one for night because it just seemed horrible, the idea of doing things in the day and then going to sleep in it. Um, but it was, um, yeah, it wasn't a whole lot of fun. And, and the idea of that, so, so this, we're starting to get into the, uh, the recovery now. Mm. Once I knew- Sorry, what, one more question. I'm cool. really curious, but well, there's more than one more question, but I'm really curious how the conversations go when you first meet the medical professionals. Are you like, hi, oh, yeah, I'm actually, uh, you know, an exercise science professor. I kind of know a lot of stuff. Or are you very humble and, and don't tell them anything about your background? How does that all, all generally, generally go? You know what? They often ask. And when they ask, I often play it down. And, I, and, I, and, and they often say things like, oh, well, I'm so sorry if I'm teaching you so games. And I... Uh, and I sort of say, and my response to that is, honestly, it talks to me like I'm an idiot. Like, yep. I, I'm the patient here. You explain it to me the way you would explain it to any patient. Don't make any assumptions about what I know or don't know. Um, and of course, oh, most of what they say, I do know, but, but, but I don't want to be treated differently. And I don't want, yeah. and you know, I, if, if I have questions that are more advanced than they're telling me, then I would just ask those questions. So. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I don't, I certainly don't sort of, uh, make advantage of my position and partly because I'm a lecturer, I'm not a medical professional. Yeah. Um, so I, and I certainly don't specialize in injury. Um, so this is, you know, I, I know my scope of practice. I think it's important that people know their scope of practice and their boundaries. And, and I very much, um, you know, refer to professionals in that sense. Hello. Okay. So, so anyway, so I, I, I got the MRI results back. I contacted, um, health insurance, our health insurance. I contacted a knee specialist and booked a consultation. And, um, he obviously did a, a pretty substantial assessment and talked through sort of likely recovery. And one of the key things that he sort of said was, um, if you're in the States, would operate tomorrow, that'd be it. Um, but the problem with that is that right now your knee is, well, the words he used is 
He doesn't like to, he wants to operate on a calm knee. He wants to operate on a knee that has had as much chance for any soft tissue injury to recover or that's going to recover to recover so that he can go in and deal with exactly what needs to be done. And that's that. And is that the same as kind of inflammation or is this post the kind of acute inflammation phase? So the acute, the acute inflammation has dropped off considerably yeah. over the six weeks. I mean, um, you know, uh, eight weeks ago when I did it and seven weeks ago when I first had a consultation, uh, the swelling was drastic. Um, probably movements were limited as much by the swelling as by, by the uh, inability to move. Um, and now the swelling is massively reduced. Um, I'm weight bearing without a leg brace. Um, I'm really down to an ACL tear. And, and actually the consultant is, is of the impression that the MCL wasn't a complete rupture, uh, might, might have been a grade two and might have. Which is a rupture is where it's actually separated, right? Rupture, rupture is a complete yeah. tear. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and the medial, the lateral ligament obviously was sprained. So that's made a recovery in that time because it's not been stressed. The medial ligament, he, he thinks was probably a grade two tear, which has obviously made a significant recovery in that time as well. The bone bruising and the swelling has gone down. So now we're looking at um, ACL reconstruction and uh, sutures in the meniscus to hold that back together again and so forth. So, so it's interesting to think because my, my initial, psych psychologically, my initial response is I don't want to wait six weeks or eight weeks or 10 weeks or 12 weeks for surgery because in that time, my leg is getting weaker. Mm -hmm. I want to have the surgery now so I can start recovery tomorrow and I can bring everything forward. But it makes perfect sense what he said about, I want to operate on a calm knee. You know, when you're still in that acute phase, you know, um, presumably going in to do surgery on an, on an acute injury is beneficial in some, in some ways, but has risks because of the other swelling and the other acute right. injuries in there that, that might not need surgery. So. So I had six weeks in an e-brace, went back to the consultant, which I, who I saw on Monday of this week. So today's Wednesday, I saw them on Monday. Um, and we have a plan in mind for the surgery and so forth, and then for the recovery beyond then. So, so medically, yeah. I guess that's that. Um, and I guess, I mean, I'm more than happy to talk about anything else related to that, but I, but I, yeah. I also thought it was in, it would be interesting to talk about kind of how my training has been impacted and adapted as a result of this. Yeah, I would definitely want to get into that. But before you go there, so is there an option here to not go surgery? And what does that look like? Or is that just not ideal? There, there it actually is. So if my MCL and my, if all the other, if all the other parts are, are healed, the 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 um, ACL is not going just going to grow back. It's a complete rupture, and the MCL oh. won't. I, I'm sorry, and the meniscus won't grow, won't recover because the nature of the tear, the meniscus, the menisci don't have a good blood supply, so it's unlikely to repair. It needs sutures to kind of staple it back together. Lovely. Um, but some people do carry on without an ACL, and with the right hamstring training. Because, of course, the hamstring attaches to the, it's the back of the knee. It's the back of the tibia and fit. That can be enough to hold the tibia back and prevent that tra um, forward translation that I, I said about earlier. So right. It, it's possible. It's more of a stability thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's possible. But I would say that by the nature of, even if I don't go back to basketball, by the nature of playing golf or getting on the right. bike or running and lifting weights and so on and so forth, I would want, I want that kind of high, high risk of re-injury if you yeah. don't as well. Right. Yeah. 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 And is it pain? Is there pain? Still pain at all? No, there's no pain at all. Okay. In fact, there's never been any pain from the ACL and that's relatively common because you, you sever all the nerves as well. All right. Lovely. Yeah. <laughs> Today's episode is sponsored by Imagine Strength, the game changer in safe, simple, and effective high intensity training machines. When it comes to HIT, Imagine Strength is your go-to for intelligently designed, efficient, and affordable equipment. Their team is passionate about HIT, and it shows in every piece they craft. So why are Imagine Strength the right choice? 
Number one, they tailor make their equipment for hit studios. Number two, they provide cost effective solutions for your business. And number three, they are committed to ongoing innovation and refinement. Ready to take your hit business to the next level? Visit imaginestrength.com to discuss your needs and find the perfect gear for your studio. Join the hit revolution of Imagine Strength and transform your workout experience today. Um, uh, interesting. So, okay, yeah. So, tell what, what 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 would they do in the surgery? Just curious, what the plan is there, and then we can get into like training. Yeah. So, so the surgery will be the surgery that's offered in the UK. Uh, it's typically what's called an autograft or an allograft. I presume it's the same thing in the US. Oh, yeah. But an autograft is where they take a tendon from somewhere else in the body and they use that to replace the anterior cruciate ligament. So they would drill two small holes and they basically attach it in the same places to, to re replace the ligament. Um, but they have to take that tendon from elsewhere. And that can be done from one of three places either the patella tendon, the iliotibial tract, so the IT band that comes in down the side, uh -huh. or from the hamstring tendon on the opposite, on the contralateral leg. The other option that they could do is they could do what's called an allograft. And an allograft is to use a tendon from a cadaver, so a tendon from right. somebody else. What would be your preference, James? So my, my preference has been an autograft. Uh, partly because an allograft has in it, um, not, I'm not averse, I'm not against kind of having somebody else's tissue or dead tissue. Um, an allograft has the potential for rejection. Okay. Um, it has the subpar genetics. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I'm glad you said that. I didn't want to have to. <laughs> oh, what were you thinking? Were you yeah. thinking that? No, no, not at all, actually. <laughs> It can take a lot longer to kind of your body to bind with it. There is a chance of rejection. There is also a greater chance of infection. All right. But the, but the main thing for me is it, it can delay recovery for probably a minimum of three to four weeks. Is there a difference in cost depending on the approach? You know what? I don't know. I didn't ask. Mm. I didn't yeah. ask. That's, yeah. that's interesting. Would you be able to divulge the cost of the surgery or is that covered in your it's private? Covered in, it's covered in my health. Yeah. Thank God for that. I am. Um, in the UK, I'm I'm under the impression it's probably in the region of a ten thousand pound surgery. Really? Oh wow! I didn't think it'd be that much. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and in talking to the consultants that I know, not the consultant that's going to operate, they don't get a huge amount for it actually. Really? <laughs> yeah, they don't get a lot for that. A lot of it is covered. A lot of it goes towards the hospital that they are working within. So okay. my my care will be with Nuffield Health. Even in private, it goes towards the facility and well, medical costs, I guess. Yeah, but, but I mean, don't get me wrong. The consultations that I'm having are, are expensive for what a consultation. Right. And then you have surgery and that suddenly seems cheap for what the surgery is. So it's, um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm told that they don't make a huge amount. Um, I'm t I don't know what the amount is, but I'm told they don't make a lot. So uh, I'll say it might be telling a few porkies there, James. <laughs> uh, if I thought they meant a lot, maybe I'd consider retraining. <laughs> yeah, well, I I mean, I'm just thinking here in Ireland, it's like uh, it's subsidized, right? So it's not it, it's it's not free, um, but a lot of the stuff is covered. It's kind of complicated. I don't fully understand it, to be honest. Like, for instance, if I want to go and see a doctor, I'll pay 60 euro here. Okay. Um, so also like, you know, 50 pounds, whatever, um, or 65 dollars, whatever. Um, but then if you need treatment, I mean, it's just like NHS in terms of like, and I'm sure COVID didn't help. There's huge long waiting lists. Um, and there's lots of triage going on, depending on the severity of your issue or whatever. Um, awesome. but then the, if you have, you know, depending on what the issue is, what the disease is or injury or whatever it is, um, there's different policies in terms of like how much the HSE, just the Irish healthcare will cover it. Right. Um, but where was I going with this? Oh, yeah. But I had to, a long time ago, you might remember this. I had to go and see an expert about my shoulder. I do um, yeah. And uh, I went to see a consultant for that. And he was charging like 230 euro. And I was in there for 15 minutes. I was like, this, I am in the, I have pursued the wrong career path here. This guy is, I mean, obviously he has to pay rent on his little facility and the private hospital and all that. But still, it's like, I couldn't believe 
they were charging that much. And obviously he was very knowledgeable and a lot of expertise, but yeah, it's just mind boggling. Yeah. It's been a similar cost for the, for the consultation I've had. And uh, okay. you know, I paid my excess on my insurance now, and my insurance will now cover the rest. So I have to keep contacting them to check that they're going to cover it. <laughs> There's no reason they shouldn't do. Right. Um, but so basically the surgery, just to kind of wrap that up, the surgery yeah. that I have is um, an ACL reconstruction, which is an autograft. I will have the tendon from the hamstring of the opposite leg. And I will also have what's called a tenodesis. And basically what they do is they take a piece of, a, is they kind of slice a piece of ACL, oh, sorry, a piece of IT band um, from its attachment. And then they stretch it and reattach it further down. And that's meant to give greater rotational stability to the knee and resist rotational forces to the knee. So long and short of it is I'm going to have a pretty good scar on the back of my left leg. A good scar on the upper part of my, on the, on the inner part of my right leg and on the outer lower part of my right leg. And then two holes for ACL reconstruction, which are common. Um, yeah. I've known quite a few people who have those two little scars there. Yeah. I've seen a bunch of those. Yeah. 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 Um, so do you want to get into, go, sorry, go ahead. So, yeah. So, so, uh, yeah. And then, and then. Sutures for the meniscus, I presume that'll be done with him within the same sort of scarring and same surgeries. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So what's uh, what's the training looking like? Like if we start from the beginning again, like how soon were you able to do? I mean, firstly, could you maybe take us right back to the start of the injury? Like when you first had your strength training? I'm assuming you probably modified to like upper body on one leg only. Um, and then over time brought in the other leg and 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 I'd love to hear about all that whole progression. Yeah, so I, it was probably a week until I strength trained again, maybe five or six days. Um, I, I was very aware that obviously your body is in a degree of shock, has a lot of acute healing to recover from, and I didn't want to add any stress, any physiological stress mm. to that. Um, I was very inactive. I was on crutches for the first probably three or four days. Um, and then I was in what's called a cricketer's brace. Like, um, so basically it's like a wrap around sleeve that holds your leg in a very, very slight bend and doesn't allow anything else. Um, and then from the time I, from the day before I saw the consultant, so from, from the time I got the MRI results, um, I ordered a brace online, put it in that brace. I knew that I could now increase my range of motion, but not to increase it too much. Um, saw the consultant confirmed what I kind of knew to, to limit it to 90 degrees of flexion and no more than 10 degrees of extension. So it can't move into, it couldn't move into full extension. Mm. Um, and with that in mind, once I was in that brace, I felt pretty pretty comfortable to go in and start lifting again, to go and start training again. Um, I have a home gym, as you know, sort of a setup in my garage. And, and I'll be completely honest, at that point, I knew all cardio was out the window. So I couldn't run, couldn't cycle, I couldn't play basketball. Um, I, I toyed with the idea of buying an arm crank or goblet. So I, well, I was going to say that. Bill, Bill likes those, doesn't he? Well, at least yeah. he talks about those sometimes. Yeah, but I, I never really likes them that much. <laughs> I was also, I'm very conscious of my shoulders and knew that if I was going to go, go to a lot of upper body strength training, I wasn't going to do that in combination with a lot of upper body ergometry work. So I pretty much resigned myself to the fact that I was going to bulk up. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, I, I, once, I, once I was kind of okay with that, we should talk about um, a meal. Um, <laughs> I, I, I very quickly thought I'm going to eat what I want. I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to lift when I want and so forth. And so I went back in the gym. I went to uh, a lot of drop set training. So I increased the weight on, on most exercises to do fewer reps on the first set and then drop down the weight to a, a higher volume, a higher number of reps per set um, for 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 a break set for a breakdown or a drop set approach and i did yeah i did a uh, single leg lower body training 
Uh, it was, everything was made difficult with this because I couldn't do anything where this leg stabilized. So I couldn't, for example, do a good seated row where you would anchor with your feet because mm. I couldn't anchor with my feet. So um, pull downs. So for example, it, I, I couldn't really do pull downs. So I couldn't anchor under my knees. So I did a lot more. Not even the one knee. Anchor under one knee, and it worked well. Well, do you know what? Because of the way you kind of put your other leg under, it's, it was just too awkward to get it into. I see. The um, I did single leg knee extensions. I did single leg uh, prone leg curl. I did a lot of uh, Romanian deadlifts, single leg Romanian deadlifts, and so forth. Um, and I did, and I did a a lot of upper body training. And I would say, probably in the first couple of weeks, I trained every other day. Oh, wow. Um, just like a crazy split routine, was it? No, not at all. It was like, oh. like... <laughs> um, but with emphasis on different days, like different upper body emphasis or just the same? Not really. It was really okay. just a case of going there and be really kind of, um, uh, pissed off at the world and just kind of right. move big weights. And, um, cause you were very frustrated then. Yeah, you? I was, I was hugely yeah. frustrated. And I, 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 once I knew I could do an exercise, once I was in the position to do an exercise and my leg wasn't going to be impacted, I could, you know, lift. So, um, yeah. So I would say the volume of training increased probably for probably by about 25 to 50% in a week, pretty quickly um, for upper body exercise. Um, and I, and I, and I, well, in the first six weeks of training, I, I, I sent a message to, to Luke about this. So in the first six weeks after the injury, my, my pre-injury weight, which was almost the day before I injured myself, I was 176 pounds. I was about 12% body. And, and on, and on that's my, lean for you, right? That's Is not it? bad. I was playing a lot of basketball. I weigh, I weigh that. I'm just fat, I think. Go on. And, um, and my incline bench was on my lever gym was about 200 pounds for about eight to 10 reps. And by six weeks after, I weighed 191 pounds. Oh, wow. When I put on 15 pounds. My what body weight was still around 14, 15%, give or take. Mm -hmm. uh, so not a huge increase in like fat, but certainly an increase in fat. But my incline bench had gone up to 240 pounds for about 12 reps. It recorded this, it was 240 pounds of 12 reps. Wow. So what was really interesting was that I had got a single-minded like focus. Like I've, I was very much focused on pull-ups and presses. Like I did a lot of lat raises. I did some rows but they were not as comfortable because of my leg. And I was more anxious about being unstable doing them. Whereas when I lay down on a bench using basically a machine, or if I'm doing pull-ups where I know my weight's not through my feet at all, I could be very, you know, be very focused on what I was doing. And, and that was kind of, I guess, the intent of the training, of the training routines. Yeah. Quite interesting results quite quickly. Um, I mean, so how, six weeks got, is drastically quick, but it's yeah, quick. it is quick, I think. Um, so you think you were putting a, a fair bit of muscle then in that time, based on what you said there? Um, I think I put on a fair bit of weight. I, I think that I probably did put on some muscle. Sure. The interestingly, by experience, the heavier I am, the more I can press anyway, even if it's not per se muscle per se. Sure. So when I've, when I've topped 200 pounds, I've been able to bench more than when I weigh less. Um, even when I've topped 200 pounds and look chubby. Um, so, so I, I, I definitely, I definitely think I put on some muscle. Um, but it, but it's interesting to think that, um, well, from, from my point of view, I, I, I like I said, I went to eat kind of whatever I wanted. Now I, I have. I generally have a palate of reasonably healthy foods anyway. You know, I can sit down to a, a plate of broccoli over a bag of potato chips any day of the week. I'm quite happy with that. Um, and I, everything that has protein in it just is palatable to me. So oh, no. I probably, I've experienced I, I, that. Yeah. So I, um, one of my, one of my meals in a day is a protein shake. Um, and I, and I started having two of those a day anyway. So I went from five grams of creatine to 10 grams of creatine in a day. And I went well, in your shake or separate? 
In a shake, in a shake. Which shake do you get? That gives you creatine and the protein in one. No, I add, I add, cre- I add creatine to it. Oh, you add it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I often use Reflex. I can't think of the brand that I'm using right now, but I order it off Amazon so anybody can get it. And I will, as soon as I bring it up on my phone, I'll tell you what it is. Thanks, James. Um, and I'm not advertising them. I'm not saying this is the protein everybody should use. Other proteins are available. <laughs> of course. Uh, it's, called, it's called Excel Nutrition. So if you go on Amazon, you, you Google XL Nutrition Way. Uh, um, the last one I ordered was the white chocolate raspberry, which is oh, delicious. Yeah. Um, and two scoops of that is is about 40 grams of protein. I add five grams of creatine. And it tops out. Just creatine monohydrate. Just, yeah. 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 And that tops out uh, about 240 kilocalories. Okay. And just remind me, a quick diversion on this. So the creatine obviously helps with recovery, helps with some performance as well, and potentially increased gains in terms yeah, of... Yeah, definitely. So I would say that creatine is probably a big one on gains. I mean, there's a huge amount of research now on creatine yeah. and brain health as much as anything. There's a big push for uh, from the exercise science community that creatine probably should be supplemented by everybody in the world, not just wow athletes or um i'm gonna buy some yeah i used to take it but yeah go ahead and and and, and where people often said oh you need to cycle off it because the long-term you know negative implications are not known they're still there's non-recorded um you know i do i do cycle off it every time i finish a part i give it a few weeks before i order a new one but okay but i don't you know record the time that i'm off it for i don't say okay i'm going to come off it for 12 weeks it's not uh, it's, it's not steroidal in, in that in that sense. So, so just a couple um, of weeks you cycle off it for, like two weeks, is it? Yeah, probably two or three weeks. So then we get point of rushing to order the next pot, uh, okay. the next like tub, like five hundred gram tub. Um, but but yeah, and I, and I ordered that off Amazon, and it's uh it's uh let me bring it back up again. Um, it's not any particular expensive brand it's creatine's not hugely cheap it's optimum nutrition oh yeah um yeah so it's it's you know accessible uh, yeah so so interestingly i i you know with my uh increased calories probably a large percentage of that was protein anyway uh, um i typically pre uh pre-injury wouldn't eat after a certain time um, just because I found that it disrupted my sleep patterns mm-hmm. anyway. I found that I got better sleep uh, if I didn't eat um, too late. I also, if, if I'm doing any intermittent fasting, I would say not eat after like 6 or 7 p.m. and then not eat until like midday the next day. And that gives me an 18-hour fast. So any intermittent fasting went out the window. But let's say I'm sat watching TV now at 10 o'clock at night and I'm hungry, I just go mix some protein shakes. I don't, I don't go and raid the cupboard for anything like potato chips or anything, but some days I do, but, but more often than not, it's, a, it's an extra protein shake. So, so my, my protein intake went up, my creatine intake went up. They were a huge part of calorie intake, I would say. Um, and yeah, I made substantial increases in let's, let's loosely call it body mass and, and strength. I love your honesty because you understand like the realities of gaining that much weight, like what it breaks down to. So I love the honesty around that. It's refreshing. I mean, I, I, you know, I look in the mirror and I see the difference and, you know, all the t-shirts, like the t-shirts and the shorts that I wear suddenly got a lot, t- like 15 pounds, quite a lot. Yeah. Uh, got, got tighter. Um, but not, not, in, not in just the right. How does your, how are you happy? How do you feel about your body composition? Like, do you prefer the way you look now or do you prefer the way you look before where you're leaner? You know, I, I'm kind of, I'm okay with my, with my, with my body. Um, I know that most people in the industry have some degree of kind of muscle dysmorphia. They go through phases of, I want to bulk up, I want to bulk up. Then they feel fat and then they want to lean down, lean down, lean down. And I, and I'm not exempt from that, but I see, I see the merits of being bulkier by being bigger. And I see the merits of being leader. Um, Ironically, in the winter, I'd rather carry more because you wear more clothes, so you're not showing off as much. And in the summer, I'd rather be leaner for the beach. 
Um, but I, I, once I was in the state I was in, it, there was just no point in trying to, it just didn't seem worthwhile to try and stay lean or ripped because I wasn't able to, like, I couldn't even go on and take 10,000 steps. I was taking, some days I took less than 2,000 steps. Oh. Yeah. So, um, you know, so it's like, it's like being an American. And are you, <laughs> and are you doing, uh, you, you know, the listeners, um, are you doing any, any, a work on the injured leg now, or is it still? Yeah. Okay. So, so, so interestingly, um, one of the things that I experienced was I definitely had a degree of overtraining that became evident in my left, um, uh, bicep slash brachioradialis. Um, so I proud that it presented itself, uh, by pain in supination. Pain. Yeah, so so pain in supination. So if I started in a supinated position, yeah. pull ups or pull downs, that's fine. Anything in a neutral grip is fine. But if I if I went to do uh, like let's say I did a dumbbell curl or an incline dumbbell curl, um, I would find that moving th moving from a neutral to a supinated grip was was painful, mm. um, and that also presented itself in a movement from uh, um, having a dumbbell on a knee. To lifting it to this position, I'm moving it through a position where I'm, I mean, that's pronation, but I'm moving it from a neutral position to an outward position. It mm -hmm. felt unstable in that part of my arm. Um, but that's likely because, well, primarily, probably because of the degree of overtraining. So because of the nature of what I couldn't, couldn't do, I found that I would do, well, pull-ups, I would do uh, preacher curls, I would do standing barbell curl, I would do incline dumbbell curls um you know I, I i went to kind of every every movement that i like i, yeah. I literally some days just did every exercise i could think of doing you know just I curls would... though james just does curls everyone <laughs> one, <laughs> one, else. one day i did i did dumbbell once i could do dumbbells again uh, early on because because at first i couldn't rest the dumbbell on that leg to lift it up once i should go back to doing dumbbell press i would do dumbbell press overhead press on a machine with a pronate grip, drop set to a neutral grip, to lateral raises, to upright rows, all of which are, you know, I mean, I, you know, I, and the, I guess the cautionary tale in all of this is that there's a, a psychology of, okay, I still want to be burning calories or I still want to be bulking up or whatever it might be. And of all people who should know better, I've still, you know, overtrained effectively. So, got, you know, how often were you training? I was probably, Is it every other day. I was probably about two and a half times a week by that point. Okay. Even Maybe that was getting to be too much. If, well, by that point, I'd probably as well, I guess. hit that, hit that, that kind of tweaky injury point, taking a bit of time off. We had a family vacation to Mallorca, Lovely. Um, which I was advised to go on by the consultant. He said, no, you'll be, you'll be fine. Just wear your leg brace, don't do anything stupid, you know, you'll be fine. So that was great. I basically laid on a sun lounge by the pool. So you were just being very responsible about going to Mallorca and chilling out. You're just doing the right thing, you know? <laughs> exactly. I got told that. <laughs> you got told that. <laughs> um, I, I walked a lot more. I was weight bearing quite comfortably then. Um, I was very conscious that wearing the leg brace was impacting my gait. So because I couldn't extend my knee properly or I couldn't flex it beyond a point, if I was up and down stairs, I kind of had this hip hinge happening. So I was very careful over not doing something to irritate the opposite side. And, and I think that's something to be cautious of um, because it would have been easy to go, okay, I can wait there, I'm going to walk, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Uh, um, I, I overdo it and actually I... I you know, I didn't, and I took time off training through that vacation. Um, so I, so I then took time off again. You know, so yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. My training now. So you have, mm. you have sort of my yeah, yeah yeah now. So I have to think. A key thing that I'm thinking right now is I'm in kind of probably the the last four weeks pre surgery. Um, so we haven't set a date yet, but, but it will be sometime in October. So it could be as few as two or three weeks. It could be as much as five or six weeks. Um, but for me, I'm in a stage of get everything as strong as I can to go into surgery. But what's really interesting is 
I can't or or, not, or I wouldn't do any um, isolated movements on my right leg with with my ACL injury. Um, and the reason is um, to think about force is to think about force vectors. Okay, so he, here's the here's the, the the crux of it. If I do a knee if I do a knee extension exercise on my right leg. Then, if that's my if that's my tibia, then obviously the force is applied down here, and we think about we think about that happening. Okay, but the reality is, as as the force is applied here, the natural force vector for my bone is to do that, which, okay. which is the anterior displacement that I can't have. Okay. Now, in a leg press, that's not a problem because my hamstrings are switched on. They're firing as part of a leg press because of hip extension. So they're holding my tibia back and in place. So my quads can contract. And it's that force vector, which of course in a leg press, it's linear, not rotational. Yeah. Even if that force vector were to act in that direction at any point, which it doesn't directly, but even if it did, my hamstrings are still stabilizing my tibia. Whereas in a knee extension exercise, I mean, I'm quite specifically due to something called reciprocal inhibition, I'm sending a signal to my hamstrings to switch off. So I, ru I run a significant risk of that I see. A translation of the tibia. So, so there are certainly some exercises that I can't do. Now, what's really nice is that I do the exercise with my left leg and I let my right leg go along for the ride. Mm -hmm. And I work at probably now a good four to 10 second concentric, four to 10 second eccentric uh, movement, unilateral, but I let my right leg go along for the ride. So I don't bring it, like I do a step where I can work in full flexion, where there's, um, where there's that stretch. And, and then I do a step where I'm doing kind of always the partial, where my right leg can sit behind the pad, and not push against it. And that helps me to kind of work through that to, to move my limbs through that range of motion. Mm. Um, and get that so, cross-education benefit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The same thing with seated leg curls. Um, a couple of weeks back, no, probably a week back, I went to doing bilateral leg presses again, um, which I hadn't done. I'd been doing single leg leg presses and I've gone to bilateral leg presses. But my range of motion is so limited in my bad knee that I typically tend to do um, 10, 10 plus reps, 10 to 20 reps, let's say bilateral. And then I move to, and then I increase the range of motion and to failure on my, my healthy leg. Um, interestingly, even while I was wearing the leg brace, because the leg brace, of course, limited the range of motion, I still did, um, deadlifts. Mm -hmm. So there is in my wife's clinic, there's a gym attached to my wife's clinic, which is I've got a plate loaded kind of deadlift shrug. Um, a lot of people will have used like the hammer strength deadlift shrug uh, uh, machine. It's not seated, it's standing. Um, and I would load that up and still do a bilateral deadlifts um, on, you know, obviously through both legs, but just controlling the range of motion to within what the knee brace allowed. And that was quite that was quite interesting to know that actually loading the muscle didn't bother it. Loading the muscle within that range of motion didn't bother it. And loading, arguably loading my knee didn't wasn't bothered by doing that. So very cool. All so right. I, and again, like I said, you know, the idea of this is to be of some use to some people. And it might be that they put a client on a leg press and they can't push through a leg press, but if you got them to do a deadlift through a limited, let's call it a limited range of motion, they're absolutely fine. So maybe, you know, so a lot of it in this case almost goes back to when I've worked with athletes with a disability, that you, you don't approach it of what they can't do. You approach it of, can they find a way to do what you want or to have the outcome that you want? Yeah. That's, that's wise words. Um, so James, I think um, we should definitely park it there and check in again because we've got another podcast scheduled for a part two, haven't we? To to carry on this um, exploring this this rehab and process for yourself. 
So thanks so much again for joining me. Really appreciate it. What's the best way for listeners to to, to find out more about you and, and message you? Is it just the email still? Yeah, of course, I'm by email, james.fisher at solent.ac.uk. Um, and I will respond to that and comes in. Thanks so much. All right, James. Well, look, um, have a great rest of your day. Thanks again for your time. And if everyone listening to get the show notes for this episode, please go to highintensitybusiness.com, search for episode 430. And until next time, thank you very much for listening. Let's go, let's go. Welcome to another episode brought to you by Imagine Strength, the future of safe, simple, and effective high-intensity training equipment. Are you a hit studio owner looking for equipment that's not just top-notch, but also tailored to your specific needs? Imagine Strength is your answer. Inspired by the legendary Arthur Jones, Imagine Strength is revolutionizing the hit industry with their state-of-the-art yet affordable equipment. Their team doesn't just sell hit equipment, they live and breathe it. I've personally experienced their gear at the Resistance Exercise Conference, and let me tell you, it was an intense workout that I won't soon forget, in the best way possible, of course. So why choose Imagine Strength? Number one, they provide customized solutions for hit studios. Number two, they have budget-friendly yet high-performance designs. And number three, they're committed to innovation and excellence in high-intensity training specifically. Founder Jeff Turner and his dedicated team are on a mission to make HIT accessible to everyone. Getting started is easy. Number one, visit imaginestrength.com. Number two, consult with their expert team. And number three, choose the equipment that will skyrocket your business. Don't wait. Head over to imaginestrength.com and elevate your HIT studio today with Imagine Strength.